Hooke's Law and the Spring Constant. Finally, spring is just around the corner. <laughs> Get it? I also put this in there for velocity of distance over time. We're going to talk about Hooke's Law. And Hooke's Law has to do with springs and masses hanging from them. So if you have a mass hanging from a spring and you measure the force on that spring and you measure the displacement of that spring from equilibrium. So for example, if it's sitting like this, uh, then there is its equilibrium in the middle. And if I put more you know, masses on the end of it, so let's say I just hang some more weights on top of it or on the end of it, then of course it's going to stretch out a little bit more. And this stretchiness, this difference, this is this displacement. So we're going to have an equation, and it's in your data booklet, which is nice, and it goes like this. F, H, which stands for Hooke's Law, so the force due to Hooke's Law, is going to be just equal to minus K times X. That's it. And this is in your data booklet, so you don't have to memorize it. And let's make sure that we uh, write down what everything is. So F, H is the force on the spring. X is the displacement from equilibrium in meters. And k is the spring constant. Now, what are the units of it? You could work them out by just saying, all right, let's solve for k, actually. So get k by itself. Wouldn't it be just fh over x? OK, so just be the Hooke's law force over uh, x. Well, f is in me uh, newtons, and x is in meters. So it would be newtons per meter. So that's why we figure out then that this one here has units of newtons per meter. Now, it's interesting about this negative sign. Technically, I should put that little minus here in front of it like this. Uh, the negative sign, that's because if it's a restoring force. In other words, if you displace it down, then the restoring force goes up. So it's opposite to the extension. Usually we ignore the sign, but it's important just to remember this, though. And keep in mind that um, with this spring constant, with uh, it's different for each spring. So for example, a really stiff spring will have a higher spring constant um, and a not so, like a very easily, you know, springy, a very easy to move spring will have a low spring constant. Okay, so it's different for each spring and a large K, for example, gives you a stiff spring. Let's do an example. So we have a mass and it's attached to a spring with a spring constant k, just like we've just been learning about. And you're going to go ahead and measure the force on the spring, that's f, and you're going to measure the displacement of the spring from equilibrium. And they gave you an x in centimeters. Watch out. So we have this graph, then f in newtons, and we have this graph right here on the x-axis, which is x in centimeters. The question is, what is the spring constant? It's not always so obvious, so that's why I'm going to give you what I think is a good sort of exam tip. And that is to learn how to linearize. So what do I mean by linearizing? I mean see something as a graph y equals mx plus c, or mx plus b. So where what's on the y-axis, that's this. What's on the x-axis is this one. m is going to be the gradient. And remember that uh, c is the y-intercept. Well, in our case right here, we have uh, y-intercept is 0, so that makes it kind of nice. What I'm going to do then is rewrite this equation then as you know fn, like this right here, so fn equals something right here, this k. Remember, I know that one right there, times x. That's my Hooke's law. Keep in mind, of course, there's technically a minus there, but I'm going to just kind of ignore it. Uh, so f equals kx. So do you notice then the relation? That tells me if I graph f versus x, then the spring constant will be the gradient. That's the key thing. See, because this is this m here. That means this spring constant, then k, is going to be the gradient. That wasn't obvious. So that's why I just wanted to show you this one here. Okay, this is important. That k is going to be the gradient of an f versus x graph. And so that's how I'm going to solve it. I'm just going to find the gradient of this thing, and away I go. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to say k then is going to be the gradient, which is going to be, uh, well, delta f over delta x. In this case, then let's see, the force is going to go, hmm, I can choose this point right here. Maybe I pick this point maybe here and here. So that means I go from here to here, and I'm going to see the how much it's changed in f. In this case here, it's in f, it's changed by uh, 0 to 3. So it's got 3 here, and it's just regular newtons. OK, that's fine. Divide that by delta x, which is just 1.5, right? Don't I just put in 1.5? No, watch out, it's 0 0.015. That's really important because these were centimeters. That wasn't obvious, so remember that. So that's key here. And this, by the way, now is in meters. 
So 0 0.015 is in meters. Then I do 3 divided by 0 0.015 on my calculator, and then I'm ready to go. Okay, so I just do a nice fraction here and say 3 over 0 0.015, and it's 200. So then I get that's my answer right here, so that means it's equal to 200. Now what are the units, remember? It's going to be newtons per meter. Newtons per meter. So there we go, just to write it all out nicely. So K then equals 200 newtons per meter, and away I go. So the key here, the thing I wanted you to learn was this trick about linearizing. This idea that if you see a graph, and it's a straight line graph, you can use this idea that whatever's in front of the x is going to be the gradient, and whatever's sitting by itself is going to be the y-intercept. That's it.